I'm so excited about this message because I think regardless of what's happening around you, there's still things to be thankful for. And I don't think there's anything greater to be thankful for than what I get to preach about this morning, which is the new covenant. It's called the new covenant of grace. And it doesn't matter what your situation. And I say that knowing full well, some of your situations have never looked worse. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You can be thankful for this new covenant of grace. Amen. So I hope you ate way too much. If I can be honest, these pants have never felt so tight. They weren't skinny pants before Thanksgiving. 21 days of prayer and fasting cannot come soon enough. I need it for my spirit and my body. Because these are tight. Um, anyways, not to get sidetracked. I'm so excited. Such a privilege. There would be nothing better to be able to share about. Because I'm basically sharing about how amazing our God is. How much thought he put into it our relationship, how much he's willing to pay for us and to be in relationship with us. We call it covenant. And you're like, well, that's a really old school term. And it is. It's from the Old Testament. There's really not a word that can take the place of covenant or, or a more current word because covenant is not only a contract dealing with legal and law. Covenant deals with love. And you don't have the two of those mixed together. The closest that we would have would be marriage, the marriage covenant. Uh, this month, Becky and I celebrate our 16 years of, of marriage. Come on. Uh, she's a trooper, folks. You just, um, and, you know, this was an unusual year. She said, hey, whatever you do, I already was doing. You know how this is classic guy. I've made all the plans. None of them are going to be good. And she kind of intersected and said, hey, if you really love me, you'll stop doing what you're doing and do this. And I was like, yes, I love you. So I canceled the babysitter. And she's like, listen, I just don't want to be outside freezing with a mask on eating. Go get our favorite food. Let's do it at home. And the kids really want to watch our wedding video. And I was like, oh, we have, we have tweens in the house. So I was like, yeah, man, let's do this. So we watched this wedding video, and I was in the midst of embarrassed and crying, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I don't know. Old school weddings, three hours long. It, yeah, <laughs> that's right. What? Listen, it was, it was old school. And, uh, uh, but in the midst of that, I found myself reminiscing of the goodness and the greatness of everything that's happened in our marriage. I found myself going back to where it started. And I think that's healthy in any relationship. I think that this is one of those Sundays. If you're already saved and you're a Christian, this is the opportunity to go back to the foundation of why we are who we are and why he is what he is. And if you've never been saved, I'm about to share the best news that you've ever heard in your life. I can't oversell it. I can't out-preach it. This is flat out the best news you could ever hear. So, thank you, Keys. That made me feel so good. Talking with you playing in the background, you can come up at the end. But listen, the new covenant, this is what we have had. In the Old Testament, God made covenant with his people. Every time, we were not able to keep our end of the deal up. Covenant just means that you're going to form a relationship, and both sides have responsibilities and duties. And always our side, the side of humanity, has not been able to keep their covenant with God. And so God, knowing this, has planned from the beginning to make this covenant possible for us. And so that's what we're going to talk about. The first point of this covenant, we'll jump right into it. Number one is Jesus did all the work. I don't know if you've ever done a contract. I don't know. Uh, every job I do, I end up writing out a contract and both the homeowner and myself sign it. And it has to be very specific. What am I going to do? All the responsibilities. It never ends that they always call me back and say, ah, will you put in that you're also going to, and will you also add this? I'm a little worried about this. Can you be a little clear on the verbiage that you're going to? And it's completely right because it's a legal document. However that is, we have never been able to keep up our side of it. God has always kept up his side. 
And so he has made it so that we can be in covenant and relationship with him. And Jesus has done all the work. What does that mean? Let's look at this. Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. Listen to this. As Jesus is sitting at the Last Supper and he says, And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. This is symbolic. This means more than they could have ever realized, although I feel like they had a sense of the gravity of what was happening. Because he was saying, this is not just bread, but this is my body which will be broken for you. Meaning, he's just about to go to the cross, and he's about to pay for all of their sins up to that point and in their future. This is a huge moment. He says, take this. He broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Remember, Jesus is paying all this price. Then he said, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after that, they had, uh, sorry. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you as the new covenant of my blood. Essentially, Jesus is saying, every other covenant that we've had, God promises to be your God, to cover you, to love you to protect you, to provide for you. And we promise in return to love him back. Every covenant we have gotten sidetracked, started to love other things, started to be discouraged, started to be upset and grumble, and started to go our own way. And that causes separation from Jesus. So we wouldn't have to have separation. He says, listen, I'm going to make a new contract we're going to sign it together. I'm going to sign that I will absolutely do my part. I'm also going to sign for you. You say, what kind of contract is that? It's a one-sided contract. He says, I'm going to sign my side. I will always love you, protect you, provide for you, be your God. And by the way, if you ever fault, if you ever have a misstep, if you ever sin, if you ever get sidetracked, on your side of the contract, I'm going to sign for the liability of whatever you might do. And this is where Jesus has paid. Jesus has done all the work. Amen. I am so glad because I don't know how old you are or how far you can look back over your track record, but my track record is not great. <laughs> uh, uh, it doesn't take a, a statistic scientist to know that I'm going to make a mistake. And what, the, what God has done is sent his son to pay for any mistake that I might make so that we can live in this new covenant called grace. Amen? So Jesus goes to the cross. In that moment on the cross where he says it's finished, he has essentially paid for our contract, for anything that we might mess up or make a mistake. On the cross, he says it's finished. This is the mind-boggling part. He's saying, in this moment, I have just paid for any mistake, any breach of contract, anything that you will do from this moment for eternity. When he says it's finished, remember, Jesus did all the work. We can't keep our side up with the contract, so God signed on liability on both sides to take the liability for what we might do. Number two is... Jesus took your place, right? Where we should be paying, Jesus is paying. Listen, listen to this. We, we, we know David. We know he made some big mistakes. Listen to this verse after David has made a huge mistake. Mind you, the Bible says that he's a man after God's own heart. Psalms 51, 1 through 3, is, he's talking to Jesus after this mistake. He's talking to God. Generous in love, God, give grace. Huge in mercy. Wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my guilt. I don't know if you've ever gotten involved in something that was a mistake where you felt like you couldn't get it off even if you scrubbed. I don't know if you've ever felt the permeating toxicity of evil and sin and you wish that you could scrub or take a shower or a bath. He says, I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. David is saying, hey, I know the mistakes I've made. It feels like everywhere I go, my sins are just staring. You ever had somebody mad mug you? You don't know why, but they're just staring at you. You could feel it on the side of your face. You're just like, you see it and you're like shocked by it. What are you looking at? I don't know if you've ever known what it's like to have sin mad mug you. 
Another translation, the NIV says, my sin is always before me. doesn't matter where I go, what I'm about to do. It feels like my sin just follows me everywhere I go. Listen to David who says, now, that same David, listen to what he has to say in, in Romans 4, 6. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from his works. Think of this. David's saying, can you imagine how blessed it would be to have God look at me and see righteousness even though I've done these things that seem to be following me around? David goes on to say, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Ooh. Think of this. Sins forgiven. Transgressions covered. Mind you, the old covenant pointed out all your transgressions, called you out on everything. The new covenant covers your transgressions. There's such a difference. Can you feel the love in this contract of love and grace? And can you imagine how blessed it is for a person to never have their sins counted against them? Well, this is where people start to get scared. Because people are like, well, if grace is that great, if nothing I do will ever count against me, why would I change? I would like to propose that an unbelievable great gift will elicit an unbelievable response. I think if you understand grace and the gift that is given, there's no way that you waste it. <clears throat> a few years back, Becky and I were in a transition period, and I had worked for an investor for probably three and a half, four years. I had stopped working in that investor with that investor, and I had tried to start a new business. Now I say tried because it didn't work. <laughs> I was about six months into it, and I don't know if you've ever been in a season where you feel like doors are just closing. And so many doors are closing that you're like, well, this is crazy. This must be God. So at least a little bit of the weight is off because you're like, I don't know what's going on. Every door is closing. In the middle of that, I already had a meeting plan with the investor that I used to work with, who I, I loved working for. And uh, Becky and I, just before that meeting, had met. <laughs> met. This is what happens when you have four kids. You're like, can I schedule a meeting? <laughs> we need to talk, and it's not going to happen unless we schedule a meeting. <laughs> At that point, we had four kids. We sat down and talked, and we knew for a fact that within a month and a half, not only would money be tight, but we would not be able to pay our car payment or our home payment. Month and a half. And that's, that's like not living normal. That's like living tight. It was so tight that to go to this meeting, it was downtown, so you got to pay for parking. It was so tight that I went an hour early so I could find street parking because I could not afford to pay $12 and park in a garage. This is how tight it is. I need to pay $350, not $12. In Jesus' name. I get there early. I circle, I circle. I'm getting so mad. There's not a single street spot open. So upset, I pull in, I take my tag, my ticket. I'm like, Lord, you know I don't have 12 bucks right now. Don't know what's going on. I go into the meeting. I'm trying to, like, breathe. Don't seem just disheveled. And I sit down. We talk through the meeting. At the end of the meeting, they look across the table and said, how's your family? How's your finances? This is not what the meeting's about. I gave them the canned answer. You know that answer when you really don't want to. Like, I don't want to go to this meeting and be like, I'm the worst ever. We're barely making it. I'm a business failure. You don't want to go into that because we're talking about future opportunities. You want to be like, yeah, I got it together. You're going to be blessed to have me. Uh, but I was like, oh, the kids are great. Becky's great. Da, 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 da. So they, knowing, stopped me and said, hey, no, but for real, like, like, give us the real. I don't know why they felt to ask this. They said, really, how, how are your finances doing? I just took a deep breath and I was like, well, to be honest, Becky and I just talked. We have a month and a half. If something big, I even hesitated, but I just said it. If there's not a miracle, 
we're going to be in trouble. And they looked back across the table at me and said, the most unusual, unexpected, I remember it like it was yesterday. They said, hey, God has got something so great for you in the future. You can't be worried about finances. I'm like, but I am worried. I just paid $12 for parking to come have a coffee with you. Thank you for paying. They said, listen, you can't imagine what God has in your future. This will not be forever. They proceeded to write a check. <sighs> Slide it across the table. This check monetarily was the large, I, it blew my mind. It basically was more than I'd made in the last six months <laughs> in a single check. And they said, hey, you don't have to worry about finances. God is going to provide. Now, the amount of that check was not what changed my life. It was the God part of that check where all of a sudden I was like, God, you see me? God, you're providing? God, you know about this? God, you've made a way that I could not see? You never stop working? You never stop working? I'm not going to sing it, but it was the theme song of my life. I would end up working for that investor later for another four or so years. Can I tell you that I never once complained about my pay? I never once worked less than a 40-hour week. I never once thought about cheating him because he had so much money. This gift had set up something in me that was like, yeah, what do we need? Saturday afternoon? All right, I'm in. I would like to tell you that God's gift of grace is so big that it does not leave you the chance of being like, well, I'm going to stay in my sin because it'll never. But it gives you the opportunity to change in a way that you could have never changed without his grace. This grace is so powerful. Not only will Jesus help you get where you're supposed to be, but it will inspire. Think of this. Grace gives you the opportunity to work as hard as you can to do what you're supposed to do. And when you fail, there's no guilt. There's no weight. There's no what? You mean I can be free to just go after it? Not have to worry about a misstep? This grace is something unbelievable. Listen to this. I love this. Timothy Keller posted this the other day. It says, if you grasp the gospel of grace, the clear view of your flaws and your sins will make Christ's love for you all the more precious. It's not that he just covers it up and you don't see it anymore. He's paying for these things. It's electrifying and amazing. Christians have the unique identity based in Christ's performance and not ours. This is that gift of grace. Number one, I'm thankful that God is, Jesus is doing the work. Number two, that Jesus took your place. Number three, the only thing Jesus asks is for us to believe. Jesus asks us to believe. That's it. What is our part in this contract? Do we pay for anything? Do we have to pay if we make a mistake? Do we get kicked out if we, we have a breach of contract? No. Who's paying? He is. Who's taking my place? He is. Who's liable? He is. All he's asking is that you would believe. Listen to the scripture here. Hebrews 8, 12 through 13 says, for I will forgive their wickedness. What, what is this thing that I have to believe? This is all you have to believe. That he'll forgive your wickedness. That he remembers your sin no more. I always wonder why I can remember every misstep I've made and why that holds me back. And Jesus has forgotten it. I pray to be able to forget it like he forgets it. I pray to be able to step forward without it always before me. Because he's taking care of it. What else do I believe? By the calling of this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. Lest we get stuck still in works. Old covenant was everything you had to do. New covenant is everything that he has done. Lest you think that you working harder makes it better. If you're a doer like me, meaning I just feel better if I'm doing it. I shouldn't a lot of times, but with work or whatever, it's like, yeah, I can do that. Let's do it. If you're a doer, it makes me feel good to try and do it. The truth is I can't do it. 
It's futile for me to try and do it. But to rely on his grace and believe in it, that's his answer. Soon, this obsolete, outdated, it's going to disappear as a whole. Your part in the covenant is just to believe God's unmerited favor. Believe that you're completely forgiven for your sins. Believe that Jesus has cleansed you with his blood. And from this moment on, when he looks at you, he sees righteousness. How does he look at me and see righteousness? Remember, Jesus took your place. When God looks at me, Jesus is standing directly in front of me. God sees Jesus when he looks at me. My sins, by the way, are now mad mugging Jesus, not me. And Jesus has already taken care of that. If you believe that in this moment, you are now the righteousness of Christ. Not your righteousness, it's the righteousness of Christ. Paid for and bought by the blood on the cross. He just asks you to believe. I could not be more thankful that he's made this simple because I could mess everything up. You ever get a simple task and you just mess everything up? <laughs> Never fails. This last weekend I painted and then in the middle of painting I was like, let's change out these lights. Never fails. I have the wrong attachment, the wrong screw, the wrong drill, the wrong something. By the way, it's at my own house. All my tools are in my garage. Never fails. I miss the simplest thing up. I'm glad that God made this so simple. Don't get me wrong. It's not simple for him. It wasn't cheap for him. But he's made it simple for me. And he's made it that I can afford it and I have nothing. The last one, I'm thankful that he did all the work. I'm thankful that he took my place. I'm going to respond and believe. The last one is Jesus commands us to love. You see, the old covenant had all these thou shalt, had all these commandments to follow. The new covenant, Jesus leaves with us, just asks us to do one thing. Love your neighbors as I have loved you. Can you see the difference of going through life and living, being like, oop, almost missed that. Oop, oop, there's an opportunity. Oh, I can't. Just the old law would only let you focus on your sin. Oh, I tripped there. Oh, I made a mistake. Oh, that was the wrong thought. Oh, that was the wrong intention. Did the right thing, but I did it for the wrong reason. And you become so self-absorbed in what you do. Can you imagine that you don't have to walk around with, nope, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. You just walk around and go, yep, need to love that person. Yep, need to love that person. Yep, I can love that person. Mind you, I know right now, we are not in an atmosphere of love. This is just not love flowing around. But the Bible says that's how they'll know that you're in covenant with me, by your love. How are they going to be tell who Christians are? Is it because they're going to call everybody out on what they've done wrong? Let me show you what you're doing wrong. That's not what he said. Hey, let me help you because you're making mistakes. That's not what he said. He said, will you love them? Now, if he's asking you to love them, I don't have much problem. I have a couple minutes. Loving my wife or my kids. He's asking you to love people that you don't want to love. He's asking you to love people that aren't your people. He's asking you to love people that you don't usually hang around with. He's asking you to love people that have different views and ideologies than you do. Because what would be the reason to implore you to love people you love? Except for Jesus said, if you would, let's look at this scripture. John 13, 34 and 35. A new covenant I give to you. This is Jesus talking just before he's about to pay for our covenant. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is our great example. To make a covenant with us, he came down to earth as man. He stayed blameless, holy, and righteous. Everywhere that we failed, he did not fail. He held up his side of the contract. Then he took on all the failures that we would have ever in history on the cross. 
Mind you, he did not come as a king and wealth and, and all the rest of it. He came as an unnoticeable, born in a manger, not a huge entourage. People weren't calling out his name. They did sometimes. The rest of the time, they want to kill him. Then he went up on the cross to pay for everything that we would ever do. That's why David, that's why Paul says, imagine. None of your sins going on or, or, or you not being responsible or none of your sins being counted against you because they've been all counted against Jesus. This Jesus that's telling us to love like he loved is on the cross praying for those that are killing him. I don't know how he does it. I know I'm going to fail at it, but I'm thankful that he's taking my place in my failures. I think it's something to aspire for. I think it's something to go after. This is the guy on the cross who prays for all those killing him, then looks over to guys that he shouldn't be with. He didn't make any mistakes. He wasn't a robber, a thief. He shouldn't deserve this. He looks over at them, and one of them gets a sense of what's going on and takes a deep breath and a sigh and says, he's the real deal. Would you help me? And in his worst moment, he takes time to help somebody else. I think in this, I hate the word, unprecedented time, I think we can follow God's example. I think our church is following his example. We're helping people more than we ever have. I think you can help people in the middle of this. And you're going to help them with love. Not with correction. Not to change them. None of that stuff. You're going to help them with love. People that have never been loved unconditionally. How can we do this? You'll know you can do this because you've received it. You can't give something you don't have. A quick check. I have an old car. Every once in a while, I got to check the oil. I pull out the dipstick. Got to see where are we at. A quick check is what kind of love is flowing out of you? It'll give you a little insight as to which covenant you're working under. Are you partially mixed with the old covenant? I'd like to point out everybody else's faults right now because I'm pointing out mine too. It makes me feel better. Or are you part of the new covenant? Oh, no big deal. Let me, let me, let me cover for that. Oh, no big deal. Somebody's already paid. You don't have to feel bad about that. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Somebody took care of me. Let me take care of you. Oh, hold on. You think this is bigger than you've ever experienced, worse than you've ever experienced? I got a guy. I got a guy. He can take care of all of that for you. And I think it will just show of the covenant that we're partaking in, that we don't deserve, that is over the top gracious for us, that covenant of grace, the band can come up. I want to pray for you today because I, in studying this word out, I even told Pastor Chad, I struggle with the covenant of grace. I say, well, why do you struggle? Well, I grew up old school. I grew up in places that, that congratulated me a lot on outward things and not as much on inward things. I learned from a young age, even before I came to know Jesus, that uh, there are certain things that I could do that would get people's love and approval and praise. And so when I became a Christian, not everything changed. And so I would try my hardest to do things that would earn God's love, approval, and praise. And I vacillate back and forth between the old covenant and the new covenant. Sometimes the old covenant makes me feel better because I go, yeah, I did that. I'm trying hard. I'm working so hard. You guys see how hard I'm working at this? You guys noticing what I'm doing? And the new covenant which just allows me to rest on what he's provided. And in the midst of knowing my struggles, I'm going to pray for myself, but I'd also like to pray for you. Because what
what a shame it would be if you're taking hits, if you're carrying sin, if condemnation is just wreaking havoc on you, if you feel like there's a billboard of your sin following you everywhere you go, if you feel like you're not good enough, not right enough, if you feel like nobody's ever going to see the inner you, the real you, give you a chance, that would be, I, I, I don't even know what to say because that's all been taken care of. It doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to feel that. You don't have to pay for that. 